Chapter One of the Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves by Tobias Smollett. Chapter One in which certain personages of this delightful history are introduced to the reader's acquaintance. It was on the great northern road from York to London, about the beginning of the month of October, and the hour of eight in the evening, that four travellers were, by a violent shower of rain, driven for shelter into a little public house on the side of the highway, distinguished by a sign which was said to exhibit the figure of a black lion. The kitchen in which they assembled was the only room for entertainment in the house, paved with red bricks, remarkably clean, furnished with three or four Windsor chairs, adorned with shining plates of pewter and copper saucepans nicely scoured, that even dazzled the eyes of the beholder, while a cheerful fire of sea-coal blazed in the chimney. Three of the travellers who arrived on horseback, having seen their cattle properly accommodated in the stable, agreed to pass the time until the weather should clear up, over a bowl of rumbo which was accordingly prepared but the fourth refusing to join their company took his station at the opposite side of the chimney and called for a pint of twopenny with which he indulged himself apart at a little distance on his left hand there was another group consisting of the landlady a decent widow her two daughters the elder of whom seemed to be about the age of fifteen and a country lad who served both as waiter and ostler the social triumvirate was composed of Mr. Fillet, a country practitioner in surgery and midwifery, Captain Crow, and his nephew Mr. Thomas Clark, an attorney. Fillet was a man of some education and a great deal of experience, shrewd, sly, and sensible. Captain Crow had commanded a merchant ship in the Mediterranean trade for many years and saved some money by dint of frugality and traffic. He was an excellent seaman, brave, active, friendly in his way and scrupulously honest but as little acquainted with the world as a suckling child whimsical impatient and so impetuous that he could not help breaking in upon the conversation whatever it might be with repeated interruptions that seemed to burst from him by involuntary impulse when he himself attempted to speak he never finished his period but made such a number of abrupt transitions that his discourse seemed to be an unconnected series of unfinished sentences, the meaning of which it was not easy to decipher. His nephew, Tom Clark, was a young fellow, whose goodness of heart even the exercise of his profession had not been able to corrupt. Before strangers, he never owned himself an attorney without blushing, though he had no reason to blush for his own practice, for he constantly refused to engage in the cause of any client whose character was equivocal and was never known to act with such industry as when concerned for the widow and orphan, or any other object that sued in forma pauperis. Indeed, he was so replete with human kindness, that as often as an affecting story or circumstance was told in his hearing, it overflowed at his eyes. Being of a warm complexion, he was very susceptible of passion, and somewhat libertine in his amours. In other respects, he piqued himself on understanding the practice of the courts, and in private company he took pleasure in laying down the law but he was an indifferent orator and tediously circumstantial in his explanations his stature was rather diminutive but upon the whole he had some title to the character of a pretty dapper little fellow the solitary guest had something very forbidding in his aspect which was contracted by an habitual frown his eyes were small and red and so deep set in the sockets that each appeared like the unextinguished snuff of a farthing candle gleaming through the horn of a dark lanthorn his nostrils were elevated in scorn as if his sense of smelling had been perpetually offended by some unsavoury odour and he looked as if he wanted to shrink within himself from the impertinence of society he wore a black periwig as straight as the pinions of a raven and this was covered with a hat flapped and fastened to his head by a speckled handkerchief tied under his chin he was wrapped in a great coat of brown frieze, under which he seemed to conceal a small bundle. His name was Ferret, and his character distinguished by three peculiarities. He was never seen to smile, he was never heard to speak in praise of any person whatsoever, 
and he was never known to give a direct answer to any question that was asked, but seemed, on all occasions, to be actuated by the most perverse spirit of contradiction. Captain Crow, having remarked that it was squally weather, asked how far it was to the next market town, and understanding that the distance was not less than six miles, said he had a good mind to come to an anchor for the night, if so be as he could have a tolerable berth in this here harbor. Mr. Phillip, perceiving by his style that he was a seafaring gentleman, observed that their landlady was not used to lodge such company, and expressed some surprise that he, who had no doubt endured so many storms and hardships at sea, should think much of traveling five or six miles a horseback by moonlight. For my part, said he, I ride in all weathers, and at all hours, without minding cold, wet, wind, or darkness. My constitution is so case-hardened that I believe I could live all the year at Spitzbergen. With respect to this road, I know every foot of it so exactly that I'll engage to travel forty miles upon it blindfold without making one false step, and if you have faith enough to put yourselves under my auspices, I will conduct you safe to an elegant inn where you will meet with the best accommodation. Thank you, brother, replied the captain. We are much beholden to you for your courteous offer, but, howsomever, you must not think I mind foul weather more than my neighbors. I have worked hard aloft and alow in many a taut gale. But this here is the case, you see. We have run down a long day's reckoning. Our beasts have had a hard spell. And as for my own hap, brother, I doubt my bottom planks have lost some of their sheathing, being as how I ain't used to that kind of scrubbing. The doctor, who had practiced aboard a man of war in his youth, and was perfectly well acquainted with the captain's dialect, assured him that if his bottom was damaged, he would new pay it with an excellent salve, which he always carried about him to guard against such accidents on the road. But Tom Clark, who seemed to have cast the eyes of affection upon the landlady's eldest daughter, Dolly, objected to their proceeding further without rest and refreshment, as they had already traveled fifty miles since morning, and he was sure his uncle must be fatigued both in mind and body, from vexation as well as from hard exercise, to which he had not been accustomed. Philip then desisted, saying he was sorry to find the captain had any cause of vexation, but he hoped it was not an incurable evil. This expression was accompanied by a look of curiosity, which Mr. Clark was glad of an occasion to gratify, for as we have hinted above, he was a very communicative gentleman, and the affair which now lay upon his stomach interested him nearly. "'I assure you, sir,' said he, "'this here gentleman, Captain Crow, who is my mother's own brother, has been cruelly used by some of his relations. He bears as good a character as any captain of a ship on the Royal Exchange, and has undergone a variety of hardships at sea. What do you think now of his bursting all his sinews, and making his eyes start out of his head, in pulling his ship off a rock, whereby he saved to his owners? Here he was interrupted by the captain, who exclaimed, Belay, Tom, belay. Prithee, don't veer out such a deal of jaw. Clap a stopper on thy cable, and bring thyselves up, my lad. What a deal of stuff thou art pumped up concerning bursting and starting and pulling ships. Lord, have mercy upon us. Look ye here, brother, look ye here. Mind these poor crippled joints. Two fingers on the starboard, and three on the larboard hand. Crooked, do you see? Like the knees of a bylander. I'll tell you what, brother, you seem to be a... Ship deep laden. Rich cargo current setting into the bay hard gale lee shore all hands in the boat tow round the headland self pulling for dear blood against the whole crew snap go the finger braces crack went the eye blocks bounce daylight flash starlight down i foundered dark as hell whiz went my ears and my head spun like a whirligig that don't signify I i'm a yorkshire boy as the saying is all my life at sea, brother, by reason of an old grandmother and maiden aunt, a couple of old stinking kept me these forty years out of my grandfather's estate, hearing as how they had taken their departure, came ashore, hired horses, and clapped on all my canvas, steering to the northward, to take possession of my, but it don't signify talking, these two old piratical had held a palaver with a lawyer, an attorney, Tom, do you mind me, an attorney, and by his assistance hove me out of my inheritance? That is all, brother. 
hove me out of five hundred pounds a year. That's all. What signifies? But such windfalls we don't every day pick up along shore. Fill about, brother. Yes, by the Lord. Those two smuggling harridans, with the assistance of an attorney, an attorney, Tom, hove me out of five hundred a year. Yes, indeed, sir, added Mr. Clark. Those two malicious old women docked the entail and left the estate to an alien. Here Mr. Ferret thought proper to intermingle in this conversation with a pish. What dost thou talk of docking the entail? Dost not know that by the statute, Westminster 2, 13 edition, the will and intention of the donor must be fulfilled, and the tenant in tail shall not alien after issue had or before? Give me leave, sir, replied Tom. I presume you are a practitioner in the law. Now you know that in the case of a contingent remainder, the entail may be destroyed by levying a fine and suffering a recovery, or otherwise destroying the particular estate before the contingency happens. If Fiafis, who possess an estate only during the life of a son, where diverse remainders are limited over, make a fiafment in fee to him, by the fiafment all the future remainders are destroyed. Indeed, a person in remainder may have a writ of intrusion, if any do intrude after the death of a tenant for life, and the writ ex grave querela lies to execute a device in remainder after the death of a tenant in tail without issue. Spoke like a true disciple of Gerber, cries Ferret. No, sir, replied Mr. Clark. Counselor Caper is in the conveyancing way. I was clerk to Sergeant Croker. Aye, now you may set up for yourself, resumed the other for you can prate as unintelligibly as the best of em. Perhaps, said Tom, I do not make myself understood. If so be as how that is the case, let us change the position, and suppose that this here case is a tale after a possibility of issue extinct. If a tenant in tale after a possibility makes a fiafment of his land, he, in reversion, may enter for the forfeiture. Then we must make a distinction between general tale and special tale. It is the word body that makes the entail. There must be a body in the tail, devised to heirs, male or female. Otherwise, it is a fee simple, because it is not limited to what body. Thus, a corporation cannot be seized in tail. For example, here is a young woman. What is your name, my dear? Dolly, answered the daughter, with a curtsy. Here is Dolly. I seize Dolly in tail. Dolly, I seize you in tail. Shat, then cries Dolly, pouting. I am seized of land in fee. I settle on Dolly's entail. Dolly, who did not comprehend the nature of the illustration, understood him in a literal sense, and, in a whimpering tone, exclaimed, Shat then, I tell thee, cursed twad. Tom, however, was so transported with his subject that he took no notice of poor Dolly's mistake, but proceeded in his harangue upon the different kinds of tales, remainders, and seasons, when he was interrupted by a noise that alarmed the whole company. The rain had been succeeded by a storm of wind that howled around the house with the most savage impetuosity, and the heavens were overcast in such a manner that not one star appeared, so that all without was darkness and uproar. This aggravated the horror of diverse loud screams, which even the noise of the blast could not exclude from the ears of our astonished travelers. Captain Crow called out, Avast! Avast! Tom Clark sat silent, staring wildly, with his mouth still open. The surgeon himself seemed startled, and Ferret's countenance betrayed evident marks of confusion. The ostler moved nearer the chimney, and the good woman of the house, with her two daughters, crept closer to the company. After some pause, the captain, starting up, These, said he, be signals of distress. Some poor souls in danger of foundering. Let us bear up ahead, and see if we can give them any assistance. The landlady begged him, for Christ's sake, not to think of going out, for it was a spirit that would lead him astray into fens and rivers, and certainly do him a mischief. Crow seemed to be staggered by this remonstrance, which his nephew reinforced, observing that it might be a stratagem of rogues to decoy them into the fields, that they might rob them under the cloud of night. Thus exhorted, he resumed his seat, and Mr. Ferret began to make very severe strictures upon the folly and fear of those who believed and trembled at the visitation of spirits, ghosts, and goblins. 
he said that he would engage with twelve pennyworth of phosphorus to frighten a whole parish out of their senses then he expatiated on the pusillanimity of the nation in general ridiculed the militia censured the government and dropped some hints about a change of hands which the captain could not and the doctor would not comprehend tom clark from the freedom of his discourse concluded he was a ministerial spy and communicated his opinion to his uncle in a whisper while this misanthrope continued to pour forth his invectives with a fluency peculiar to himself the truth is mr ferret had been a party writer not from principle but employment and had felt the rod of power in order to avoid a second exertion of which he now found it convenient to skulk about in the country for he had received intimation of a warrant from the secretary of state who wanted to be better acquainted with his person notwithstanding the ticklish nature of his situation it was become so habitual to him to think and speak in a certain manner that even before strangers whose principles and connections he could not possibly know he hardly ever opened his mouth without uttering some direct or implied sarcasm against the government he had already proceeded a considerable way in demonstrating that the nation was bankrupt and beggared and that those who stood at the helm were steering full into the gulf of inevitable destruction when his lecture was suddenly suspended by a violent knocking at the door which threatened the whole house with inevitable demolition captain crow believing they should be instantly boarded unsheathed his hanger and stood in a posture of defence mr Phillip armed himself with a poker which happened to be red hot the ostler pulled down a rusty firelock that hung by the roof over a flitch of bacon tom clark perceiving the landlady and her children distracted with terror conducted them out of mere compassion below stairs into the cellar and as for mr ferret he prudently withdrew into an adjoining pantry but as a personage of great importance in this entertaining history was forced to remain some time at the door before he could gain admittance so must the reader wait with patience for the next chapter in which he will see the cause of this disturbance explained much to his comfort and edification end of chapter one Chapter Two of the Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves by Tobias Smollett. Chapter Two, in which the hero of these adventures makes his first appearance on the stage of action the outward door of the black lion had already sustained two dreadful shocks but at the third it flew open and in stalked an apparition that smote the hearts of our travellers with fear and trepidation it was the figure of a man armed cap a pea bearing on his shoulders a bundle dropping with water which afterwards appeared to be the body of a man that seemed to have been drowned and fished up from the bottom of the neighbouring river having deposited his burden carefully on the floor he addressed himself to the company in these words be not surprised good people at this unusual appearance which i shall take an opportunity to explain and forgive the rude and boisterous manner in which i have demanded and indeed forced admittance the violence of my intrusion was the effect of necessity in crossing the river my squire and his horse were swept away by the stream and with some difficulty i have been able to drag him ashore though i am afraid my assistance reached him too late for since i brought him to land he has given no signs of life here he was interrupted by a groan which issued from the chest of the squire and terrified the spectators as much as it comforted the master after some recollection mr Phillip began to undress the body which was laid in a blanket on the floor and rolled from side to side by his direction a considerable quantity of water being discharged from the mouth of this unfortunate squire he uttered a hideous roar and opening his eyes stared wildly around then the surgeon undertook for his recovery and his master went forth with the ostler in quest of the horses which he had left by the side of the river his back was no sooner turned than ferret who had been peeping from behind the pantry door ventured to rejoin the company pronouncing with a smile or rather grin of contempt hey day 
what precious mummery is this what are we to have the farce of hamlet's ghost ed zooks cried the captain my kinsman tom is dropped astern open god uh, has not bulged too and gone to bottom pish exclaimed the misanthrope there's no danger the young lawyer is only seizing dolly in tail certain it is dolly squeaked at that instant in the cellar and clark appearing soon after in some confusion declared she had been frightened by a flash of lightning but this assertion was not confirmed by the young lady herself who eyed him with a sullen regard indicating displeasure though not indifference and when questioned by her mother replied i don't mind what a says so i don't well all his golden jacket then in the meantime the surgeon had performed the operation of phlebotomy on the squire who was lifted into a chair and supported by the landlady for that purpose but he had not as yet given any sign of having retrieved the use of his senses and here mr philip could not help contemplating with surprise the strange figure and accoutrements of his patient who seemed in age to be turned of fifty his stature was below the middle size he was thick squat and brawny with a small protuberance on one shoulder and a prominent belly which in consequence of the water he had swallowed now strutted beyond its usual dimensions his forehead was remarkably convex and so very low that his black bushy hair descended within an inch of his nose but this did not conceal the wrinkles of his front which were manifold his small glimmering eyes resembled those of the hampshire porker that turns up the soil with his projecting snout his cheeks were shriveled and puckered at the corners like the seams of a regimental coat as it comes from the hands of the contractor his nose bore a strong analogy in shape to a tennis ball and in color to a mulberry for all the water of the river had not been able to quench the natural fire of that feature his upper jaw was furnished with two long white sharp pointed teeth or fangs such as the reader may have observed in the chaps of a wolf or a full-grown mastiff and an anatomist would describe as a preternatural elongation of the dentes canini his chin was so long so peaked and incurvated as to form in profile with his impending forehead the exact resemblance of a moon in the first quarter with respect to his equipage he had a leathern cap upon his head faced like those worn by marines and exhibiting in embroidery the figure of a crescent his coat was of white cloth faced with black and cut in a very antique fashion and in lieu of a waistcoat he wore a buff jerkin his feet were cased with loose buskins which though they rose almost to his knee could not hide that curvature known by the appellation of bandy legs a large string of bandoliers garnished a broad belt that graced his shoulders from whence depended an instrument of war which was something between a back sword and a cutlass and a case of pistols were stuck in his girdle such was the figure which the whole company now surveyed with admiration after some pause he seemed to recover his recollection he rolled about his eyes around and attentively surveying every individual exclaimed in a strange tone bodikins where's gilbert this interrogation did not savor much of sanity especially when accompanied by a wild stare which is generally interpreted as a sure sign of a disturbed understanding nevertheless the surgeon endeavored to assist his recollection come said he have a good heart how dost do friend do replied the squire do as well as i can that's a lie too i might have done better i had no business to be here you ought to thank god and your master resumed the surgeon for the providential escape you have had thank my master cried the squire thank the devil go and teach your granum to crack filberds i know who i'm bound to pray for and who i ought to curse the longest day i have to live here the captain interposing nay brother said he you are bound to pray for this here gentleman as your sheet anchor for if so be as he had not cleared your stowage of the water you had taken in at your upper works and lightened your veins you see by taking away some of your blood a dead you had driven before the gale and never been brought up in this world again do you see what then you would persuade me replied the patient that the only way to save my life was to shed my precious blood look ye friend it shall not be lost blood to me i take you all to witness 
that there surgeon or apothecary or farrier or dog doctor or whatever he may be has robbed me of the balsam of life he has not left so much blood in my body as would fatten a starved flea oh that there was a lawyer here to serve him with a cicerary then fixing his eyes upon ferret he proceeded ain't you a limb of the law friend no i cry you mercy you look more like a showman or a conjurer ferret nettled at this address answered it would be well for you that i could conjure a little common sense into that numbskull of yours if i want that commodity rejoined the squire i must go to another market i trow you ledger domain men be more like to conjure the money from our pockets than sense into our skulls for my own part i was once cheated of forty good shillings by one of your brother cups and balls in all probability he would have descended to particulars had he not been seized with a return of his nausea which obliged him to call for a bumper of brandy this remedy being swallowed the tumult in his stomach subsided he desired he might be put to bed without delay and that half a dozen eggs and a pound of bacon might in a couple of hours be dressed for his supper he was accordingly led off the scene by the landlady and her daughter and mr ferret had just time to observe the fellow was a composition in which he did not know whether knave or fool most predominated when the master returned from the stable he had taken off his helmet and now displayed a very engaging countenance his age did not seem to exceed thirty he was tall and seemingly robust his face long and oval his nose aquiline his mouth furnished with a set of elegant teeth white as the drifted snow his complexion clear and his aspect noble his chestnut hair loosely flowed in short natural curls and his gray eyes shone with great vivacity as plainly showed that his reason was a little discomposed such an appearance prepossessed the greater part of the company in his favor he bowed round with the most polite and affable address inquired about his squire and being informed of the pains mr fillet had taken for his recovery insisted upon that gentleman's accepting a handsome gratuity then in consideration of the cold bath he had undergone he was prevailed upon to take the post of honor namely the great chair fronting the fire which was reinforced with a billet of wood for his comfort and convenience perceiving his fellow travellers either overawed into silence by his presence or struck dumb with admiration at his equipage he accosted them in these words while an agreeable smile dimpled on his cheek the good company wonders no doubt to see a man cased in armour such as hath been for above a whole century disused in this and every other country of europe and perhaps they will be still more surprised when they hear that man profess himself a novitiate of that military order which hath of old been distinguished in great britain as well as through all christendom by the name of knights errant yes gentlemen in that painful and thorny path of toil and danger i have begun my career a candidate for honest fame determined as far as in me lies to honor and assert the efforts of virtue to combat vice in all her forms redress injuries chastise oppression protect the helpless and the forlorn relieve the indigent exert my best endeavors in the cause of innocence and beauty and dedicate my talents such as they are to the service of my country what said ferret you set up for a modern don quixote the scheme is rather too stale and extravagant what was a humorous romance and well-timed satire in spain near two hundred years ago will make but a sorry jest and appear equally insipid and absurd when really acted from affectation at this time of day in a country like england the knight eyeing his censor with a look of disdain replied in a solemn lofty tone he that from affectation imitates the extravagancies recorded of don quixote is an impostor equally wicked and contemptible he that counterfeits madness unless he dissembles like the elder brutus for some virtuous purpose not only debases his own soul but acts as a traitor to heaven by denying the divinity that is within him i am neither an affected imitator of don quixote 
nor, as I trust in heaven, visited by that spirit of lunacy so admirably displayed in the fictitious character exhibited by the inimitable Cervantes. I have not yet encountered a windmill for a giant, nor mistaken this public house for a magnificent castle. Neither do I believe this gentleman to be the constable, nor that worthy practitioner to be Master Elizabeth, the surgeon recorded in Amadis de Gaulle, nor you to be the enchanter Alcife, nor any other sage of history or romance. I see and distinguish objects as they are discerned and described by other men. I reason without prejudice, can endure contradiction, and, as the company perceives, even bear impertinent censure without passion or resentment. I quarrel with none but the foes of virtue and decorum, against whom I have declared perpetual war, and them I will everywhere attack as the natural enemies of mankind. But that war, said the cynic, may soon be brought to a conclusion, and your adventures close in Bridewell, provided you meet with some determined constable who will seize your worship as a vagrant, according to the statute. Heaven and earth, cried the stranger, starting up and laying his hand on his sword. Do I live to hear myself insulted with such an opprobrious epithet, and refrain from trampling into dust the insolent calumniator? The tone in which these words were pronounced, and the indignation that flashed from the eyes of the speaker, intimidated every individual of the society, and reduced Ferret to a temporary privation of all his faculties. His eyes retired within their sockets. His complexion, which was naturally of a copper hue, now shifted to a leaden color. His teeth began to chatter, and all his limbs were agitated by a sudden palsy. The knight observed his condition, and resumed his seat, saying, I was to blame. My vengeance must be reserved for very different objects. Friend, you have nothing to fear. The sudden gust of passion is now blown over. Recollect yourself, and I will reason calmly on the observation you have made. This was a very seasonable declaration to Mr. Ferret, who opened his eyes and wiped his forehead, while the other proceeded in these terms. You say I am in danger of being apprehended as a vagrant. I am not so ignorant of the laws of my country, but that I know the description of those who fall within the legal meaning of this odious term. You must give me leave to inform you, friend, that I am neither bare word, fencer, stroller, gypsy, mountebank, nor mendicant nor do I practice subtle craft to deceive and impose upon the king's lieges, nor can I be held as an idle, disorderly person, traveling from place to place, collecting monies by virtue of counterfeited passes, briefs, and other false pretenses. In what respect, therefore, am I to be deemed a vagrant? Answer boldly, without fear or scruple. To this interrogation, the misanthrope replied, with a faltering accent, If not a vagrant, you incur the penalty for riding armed in a fray of the peace. But, instead of riding armed in a fray of the peace, resumed the other, I ride in preservation of the peace. And gentlemen are allowed by the law to wear armor for their defense. Some ride with blunderbusses, some with pistols, some with swords, according to their various inclinations. Mine is to wear the armor of my forefathers, Perhaps I use them for exercise in order to accustom myself to fatigue and strengthen my constitution. Perhaps I assume them for frolic. But if you swagger, armed and in disguise, assault me on the highway or put me in bodily fear for the sake of the jest, the law will punish you in earnest, cried the other. But my intention, answered the knight, is carefully to avoid all those occasions of offense. Then, said Ferret, you may go unarmed like other sober people. Not so, answered the knight. As I propose to travel all times and in all places, mine armor may guard me against the attempts of treachery. It may defend me in combat against odds, should I be assaulted by a multitude or have occasion to bring malefactors to justice. What then, exclaimed the philosopher, you intend to cooperate with the honorable fraternity of thief-takers? I do purpose, said the youth, eyeing him with a look of ineffable contempt, to act as a coadjutor to the law, 
and even remedy evils which the law cannot reach, to detect fraud and treason, abase insolence, mortify pride, discourage slander, disgrace immodesty, and stigmatize ingratitude. But the infamous part of a thief-catcher's character I disclaim. I neither associate with robbers and pickpockets, knowing them to be such, that, in being entrusted with their secrets, I may the more effectively betray them, nor shall I ever pocket the reward granted by the legislature to those by whom robbers are brought to conviction. But I shall always think it my duty to rid my country of that pernicious vermin which prey upon the bowels of the commonwealth, not but that an incorporated company of licensed thieves might, under proper regulations, be of service to the community. Ferret, emboldened by the passive tameness with which the stranger bore his last reflection, began to think he had nothing of Hector but his outside, and gave a loose to all the acrimony of his party rancor. Hearing the knight mention a company of licensed thieves, "'What else,' cried he, "'is the majority of the nation?' What is your standing army at home that eat up their fellow subjects? What are your mercenaries abroad, whom you hire to fight their own quarrels? What is your militia, that wise measure of a sagacious ministry, but a larger gang of petty thieves, who steal sheep and poultry through mere idleness, and were they confronted with an enemy, would steal themselves away? What is your, but a knot of thieves, who pillage the nation under color of law, and enrich themselves with the wreck of their country. When you consider the enormous debt of above in a hundred millions, the intolerable load of taxes and impositions under which we groan, and the manner in which that burden is yearly accumulating, to support two German electorates, without our receiving anything in return, but the shows of triumph and shadows of conquest, I say, when you reflect on these circumstances, and at the same time behold our cities filled with bankrupts, and our country with beggars, can you be so infatuated as to deny that the ministry is mad, or worse than mad, our wealth exhausted, our people miserable, our credit blasted, and our state on the brink of perdition? This prospect, indeed, will make the fainter impression, if we recollect that we ourselves are a pack of such profligate, corrupted, pusillanimous rascals as deserve no salvation." The stranger, raising his voice to a loud tone, replied, Such, indeed, are the insinuations, equally false and insidious, with which the desperate emissaries of a party endeavor to poison the minds of his majesty's subjects, in defiance of common honesty and common sense. But he must be blind to all perception, and dead to candor, who does not see and own that we are involved in a just and necessary war, which has been maintained on truly British principles, prosecuted with vigor and crowned with success, that our taxes are easy in proportion to our wealth, that our conquests are equally glorious and important, that our commerce flourishes, our people are happy, and our enemies reduced to despair. Is there a man who boasts a British heart that repines at the success and prosperity of his country? Such there are. Oh, shame to patriotism and reproach to Great Britain, who act as the emissaries of France, both in word and writing, who exaggerate our necessary burdens, magnify our dangers, extol the power of our enemies, deride our victories, extenuate our conquests, condemn the measures of our government, and scatter the seeds of dissatisfaction through the land. Such domestic traitors are doubly the objects of detestation, first in perverting truth, and secondly in propagating falsehood to the prejudice of that community of which they have professed themselves members. One of these is well known by the name of Ferret, an old, rancorous, incorrigible instrument of sedition. Happy it is for him that he has never fallen in my way, for, notwithstanding the maxims of forbearance which I have adopted, the indignation which the character of that caitiff inspires would probably impel me to some act of violence, and I should crush him like an ungrateful viper that gnawed the bosom which warmed it into life. 
These last words were pronounced with a wildness of look that even bordered upon frenzy. The misanthrope once more retired to the pantry for shelter, and the rest of the guests were evidently disconcerted. Mr. Fillet, in order to change the conversation, which was likely to produce serious consequences, expressed uncommon satisfaction at the remarks which the knight had made, signified his approbation of the honorable office he had undertaken, declared himself happy in having seen such an accomplished cavalier, and observed that nothing was wanting to render him a complete knight-errant, but some celebrated beauty, the mistress of his heart, whose idea might animate his breast and strengthen his arm to the utmost exertion of valor. He added that love was the soul of chivalry. The stranger started at this discourse. He turned his eyes on the surgeon with a fixed regard. His countenance changed. A torrent of tears gushed down his cheeks. His head sunk upon his bosom. He heaved a profound sigh and remained in silence with, with all the external marks of unutterable sorrow. The company were, in some measure, infected by his despondence, concerning the cause of which, however, they would not venture to inquire. By this time the landlady, having disposed of the squire, desired to know, with many curtsies, if his honor would not choose to put off his wet garments, assuring him that she had a very good feather bed at his service, upon which many gentlefolks of the worst quality had lain, that the sheets were well aired, and that Dolly would warm them for his worship with a pan of coals. This hospitable offer being repeated, he seemed to wake from a trance of grief, arose from his seat, and, bowing courteously to the company, withdrew. Captain Crow, whose faculty of speech had been all this time absorbed in amazement, now broke into the conversation with a volley of interjections. Split my snatch block! Odds firkin! Splice my old shoes! I have sailed the salt seas, brother, since I was no higher than the Triton's Traffle, east, west, north, and south, as the saying is. Blacks, Indians, Moors, Marattos, and Sepoys, but smite my timbers such a man of war. Here he was interrupted by his nephew, Tom Clark, who had disappeared at the knight's first entrance, and now produced himself with an eagerness in his look, while the tears started in his eyes. "'Lord, bless my soul!' cried he. "'I know that gentleman and his servant, as well as I know my own father. I am his own godson, uncle. He stood for me when I was a boy. Yes, indeed, sir, my father was steward to the estate. I may say I was bred up in the family of Sir Everhard Greaves, who has been dead these two years. This is the only son, Sir Lancelot, the best-natured, worthy, generous gentleman. I care not who knows it. I love him as well as if he was my own flesh and blood." At this period, Tom, whose heart was of the melting mood, began to sob and weep plenteously, from pure affection. Crow, who was not very subject to these tendernesses, damned him for a chicken-hearted lubber, repeating with much peevishness, "'What does cry for? What does cry for, naughty?' The surgeon, impatient to know the story of Sir Lancelot, which he had heard imperfectly recounted, begged that Mr. Clark would compose himself and relate it as circumstantially as his memory would retain the particulars. And Tom, wiping his eyes, promised to give him that satisfaction, which the reader, if he be so minded, may partake in the next chapter. End of chapter 2「Three of the Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves by Tobias Smollett. Chapter Three, which the reader on perusal may wish were Chapter the Last. The doctor prescribed a repetitur of the julep and mixed the ingredients secundum artem. Tom Clark hemmed thrice to clear his pipes, while the rest of the company, including Dolly and her mother, who had by this time administered to the knight, composed themselves into earnest and hushed attention. Then the young lawyer began his narrative to this effect. I tell you what, gentlemen, I don't pretend in this here case to flourish and harangue like a having never been called to. But what of that, you see? 
perhaps i may know as much as facts are facts as the saying is i shall tell repeat and relate a plain story matters of fact you see without rhetoric oratory ornament or embellishment without repetition tautology circumlocution or going about the bush facts which i shall aver partly on the testimony of my own knowledge and partly from the information of responsible evidences of good repute and credit any circumstance known to the contrary notwithstanding for as the law saith if so be as how there is an exception to evidence that exception is in its nature but a denial of what is taken to be good by the other party and exceptio in non acceptus format regulum you see but howsomever in regard to this here affair we need not be so scrupulous as if we were pleading before a judge sedente curia ferret whose curiosity was rather more eager than that of any other person in this audience being provoked by this preamble dashed his pipe he had just filled in pieces against the grate and after having pronounced the interjection pish with an acrimony of aspect altogether peculiar to himself if said he impertinence and folly were felony by the statute there would be no warrant of unexceptionable evidence to hang such an eternal babbler anon babbler cried tom reddening with passion and starting up i'd have you to know sir that i can bite as well as babble and that if i am so minded i can run upon the foot after my game without being in fault as the saying is and which is more i can shake an old fox by the collar how far this young lawyer might have proceeded to prove himself staunch on the person of the misanthrope if he had not been prevented we shall not determine but the whole company were alarmed at his looks and expressions dolly's rosy cheeks assumed an ash color while she ran between the disputants crying nay nay what a love of god don't then don't then but captain crow exerted a parental authority over his nephew saying avast tom avast snug's the word we'll have no boarding you see haul forward thy chair again take thy berth and proceed with thy story in a direct course without yawing like a dutch yankee tom thus tutored recollected himself resumed his seat and after some pause plunged at once into the current of narration i told you before gentlemen that the gentleman in armour was the only son of sir everhard greaves who possessed a free estate of five thousand a year in our country and was respected by all his neighbours as much for his personal merit as for his family fortune with respect to his son lancelot whom you have seen i can remember nothing until he returned from the university about the age of seventeen and then i myself was not more than ten years old the young gentleman was at that time in mourning for his mother though god knows sir everhard had more cause to rejoice than to be afflicted at her death for among friends here he lowered his voice and looked round the kitchen she was very whimsical expensive ill-tempered and i'm afraid a little upon the flighty order a little touched or so but mum for that the lady is now dead and it is my maxim de mortuis nil nisi bonum the young squire was even then very handsome and looked remarkably well in his weepers but he had an awkward air and shambling gait stooped mortally and was so shy and silent that he would not look a stranger in the face nor open his mouth before company whenever he spied a horse or carriage at the gate he would make his escape into the garden and from thence into the park where many is the good time and often he has been found sitting under a tree with the book in his hand reading greek latin and other foreign linguas sir everhard himself was no great scholar and my father had forgot his classical learning and so the rector of the parish was desired to examine young lancelot it was a long time before he found an opportunity the squire always gave him the slip at length the parson catched him in bed of a morning and locking the door to it they went tooth and nail what passed betwixt them the lord in heaven knows but when the doctor came forth he looked wild and haggard as if he had seen a ghost his face as white as paper and his lips trembling like an aspen leaf parson said the knight 
what is the matter how dost find my son i hope he won't turn out a ninny and disgrace his family the doctor wiping the sweat from his forehead replied with some hesitation he could not tell he hoped the best the squire was to be sure a very extraordinary young gentleman but the father urging him to give an explicit answer he frankly declared that in his opinion the son would turn out either a mirror of wisdom or a monument of folly for his genius and disposition were altogether preternatural the knight was sorely vexed at this declaration and signified his displeasure by saying the doctor like a true priest dealt in mysteries and oracles that would admit of different and indeed contrary interpretations he afterwards consulted my father who had served as a steward upon the estate for above thirty years and acquired a considerable share of his favor will clark said he with tears in his eyes what shall i do with this unfortunate lad i would to god he had never been born for i fear he will bring my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave when i am gone he will throw away the estate and bring himself to infamy and ruin by keeping company with rooks and beggars oh will i could forgive extravagance in a young man but it breaks my heart to see my only son give such repeated proofs of a mean spirit and sordid disposition here the old gentleman shed a flood of tears and not without some shadow of reason by this time lancelot was grown so reserved to his father that he seldom saw him or any of his relations except when he was in a manner forced to appear at table and there his bashfulness seemed every day to increase on the other hand he had formed some very strange connections every morning he visited the stable where he not only conversed with the grooms and helpers but scraped acquaintance with the horses he fed his favorites with his own hand stroked caressed and rode them by turns till at last they grew so familiar that even when they were afield at grass and saw him at a distance they would toss their manes whinny like so many colts at sight of the dam and galloping up to the place where he stood smell him all over you must know that i myself though a child was his companion in all these excursions he took a liking to me on account of my being his godson and gave me more money than i knew what to do with he had always plenty of cash for the asking as my father was ordered to supply him liberally the knight thinking that a command of money might help to raise his thoughts to a proper consideration of his own importance he never could endure a common beggar that was not either in a state of infancy or of old age but in other respects he made the guineas fly in such a manner as looked more like madness than generosity he had no communication with your rich yeoman but rather treated them and their families with studied contempt because forsooth they pretended to assume the dress and manners of the gentry they kept their footmen their saddle horses and chaises their wives and daughters appeared in their jewels their silks and their satins their negligees and trollopies their clumsy shanks like so many shins of beef were cased in silk hose and embroidered slippers their raw red fingers gross as the pipes of a chamber organ which had been employed in milking the cows in twirling the mop or churn staff being adorned with diamonds were taught to thrum the pandola and even to touch the keys of the harpsichord nay in every village they kept a rout and set up an assembly and in one place a hog butcher was master of the ceremonies i have heard mr greaves ridicule them for their vanity and awkward imitation and therefore i believe he avoided all concerns with them even when they endeavored to engage his attention it was the lower sort of people with whom he chiefly conversed such as ploughmen ditchers and other day laborers to every cottage in the parish he was a bounteous benefactor he was in the literal sense of the word a careful overseer of the poor for he went from house to house industriously inquiring into the distresses of the people he repaired their huts clothed their backs filled their bellies and supplied them with necessaries for exercising their industry in different occupations i'll give you one instance now as a specimen of his character he and i strolling one day on the side of a common saw two boys picking hips and haws from the hedges one seemed to be about five and the other a year older they were both barefoot and ragged but at the same time fat fair and in good condition who do you belong to said mr greaves 
to mary style replied the oldest the widow that rents one of them housen and how dost live my boy thou lookest fresh and jolly resumed the squire lived well enough till yesterday answered the child and pray what happened yesterday my boy continued mr greaves happened said he why mammy had a couple of little welsh coos that gin milk enough to fill all our bellies mammy's and mine and dick's here and my two little sisters at home yesterday the squire seized the coos for rent god rotten mammy's gone to bed sick and sulky my two sisters be crying at home for food and dick and i be come hither to pick haws and bullies my godfather's face grew red as scarlet he took one of the children in either hand and leading them towards the house found sir everhard talking with my father before the gate instead of avoiding the old gentleman as usual he brushed up to him with a spirit he had never shown before and presenting the two ragged boys surely sir said he you will not countenance that there ruffian your steward in oppressing the widow and fatherless on pretence of distraining for the rent of a cottage he has robbed the mother of these and other poor infant orphans of two cows which afforded them their whole sustenance shall you be concerned in tearing the hard-earned morsel from the mouth of indigence shall your name which has been so long mentioned as a blessing be now detested as a curse by the poor the helpless and forlorn the father of these babes was once your gamekeeper who died of a consumption caught in your service you see they are almost naked i found them plucking haws and sloes in order to appease their hunger the wretched mother is starving in a cold cottage distracted with the cries of other two infants clamorous for food and while her heart is bursting with anguish and despair she invokes heaven to avenge the widow's cause upon the head of her unrelenting landlord this unexpected address brought tears into the eyes of the good old gentleman will clark said he to my father how durst you abuse my authority at this rate you who know i have always been a protector not an oppressor of the needy and unfortunate i charge you go immediately and comfort this poor woman with immediate relief instead of her own cows let her have two of the best milk cows in my dairy they shall graze in my parks in summer and be foddered with my hay in winter she shall sit rent free for life and i will take care of these her poor orphans this was a very affecting scene mr lancelot took his father's hand and kissed it while the tears ran down his cheeks and sir everhard embraced his son with great tenderness crying my dear boy god be praised for having given you such a feeling heart my father himself was moved though a practitioner of the law and consequently used to distresses he declared that he had given no directions to distrain and that the bailiff must have done it by his own authority if that be the case said the young squire let the inhuman rascal be turned out of our service well gemmen all the children were immediately clothed and fed and the poor widow had well nigh run distracted with joy the old knight being of a humane temper himself was pleased to see such proofs of his son's generosity he was not angry at his spending his money but at squandering away his time among the dregs of the people for you must know he not only made matches portioned poor maidens and set up young couples that came together without money but he mingled in every rustic diversion and bore away the prize in every contest he excelled every swain of that district in feats of strength and activity in leaping running wrestling cricket cudgel playing and pitching the bar and was confessed to be out of sight the best dancer at all wakes and holidays happy was the country girl who could engage the young squire as her partner to be sure it was a comely sight for to see as how buxom country lasses fresh and fragrant and blushing like the rose in their best apparel dight their white hose and clean short dimity petticoats their gaudy gowns of printed cotton their top knots and stomachers bedizened with bunches of ribbons of various colors green pink and yellow to see them crowned with garlands and assembled on may day to dance before squire lancelot as he made his morning's progress through the village then all the young peasants made their appearance with cockades suited to the fancies of their several sweethearts and boughs of flowering hawthorn the children sported about like flocks of frisking lambs or the young fry swarming under the sunny bank of some meandering river the old men and women in their holiday garments stood at the doors to receive their benefactor 
and poured forth blessings on him as he passed. The children welcomed him with their shrill shouts, the damsels with songs of praise, and young men, with the pipe and tabor, marched before him to the maypole, which was bedecked with flowers and bloom. There the rural dance began, a plentiful dinner, with oceans of good liquor, was bespoke at the White Hart. The whole village was regaled at the squire's expense, and both the day and night was spent in mirth and pleasure. Lord help you, he could not rest if he thought there was an aching heart in the whole parish. Every paltry cottage was, in a little time, converted into a pretty, snug, comfortable habitation, with a wooden porch at the door, glass casements in the windows, and a little garden behind, well stored with greens, roots, and salads. In a word, the poor's rate was reduced to a mere trifle, and one would have thought the golden age was revived in Yorkshire. But, as I told you before, the old knight could not bear to see his only son so wholly attached to these lowly pleasures, while he industriously shunned all opportunities of appearing in that superior sphere to which he was designed by nature and by fortune. He imputed his conduct to meanness of spirit, and advised with my father touching the properest expedient to wean his affections from such low-born pursuits. My father counseled him to send the young gentleman up to London, to be entered as a student in the temple, and recommended him to the superintendence of some person who knew the town, and might engage him insensibly in such amusements and connections as would soon lift his ideas above the humble objects on which they had hitherto employed. This advice appeared so salutary that it was followed without the least hesitation. The young squire himself was perfectly well satisfied with the proposal, and in a few days he set out for the great city. But there was not a dry eye in the parish at his departure, although he prevailed upon his father to pay, in his absence, all the pensions he had granted to those who could not live on the fruit of their own industry. In what manner he spent his time in London, it is none of my business to inquire though I know pretty well what kind of lives are led by a gentleman of your inns of court. I myself once belonged to Sergeant's Inn, and was perhaps as good a wit and a critic as any Templar of them all. Nay, as for that matter, though I despise vanity, I can aver with a safe conscience that I had once the honor to belong to the society called the Town. We were all of us attorney's clerks, gentlemen and had our meetings at an alehouse in Butcher Row, where we regulated the diversions of the theatre. But to return from this digression, Sir Everhard Greaves did not seem to be very well pleased with the conduct of his son at London. He got notice of some irregularities and scrapes into which he had fallen, and the squire seldom wrote to his father, except to draw upon him for money, which he did so fast that in eighteen months the old gentleman lost all patience. At this period Squire Darnell chanced to die, leaving an only daughter, a minor, heiress of three thousand a year, under the guardianship of her uncle Anthony, whose brutal character all the world knows. The breath was no sooner out of his brother's body than he resolved, if possible, to succeed him in Parliament as representative for the borough of Ashington. Now you must know that this borough had been for many years a bone of contention between the families of Greaves and Darnell and at length the difference was compromised by the interposition of friends on condition that sir everhard and squire darnell should alternately represent the place in parliament they agreed to this compromise for their mutual convenience but they were never heartily reconciled their political principles did not tally and their wives looked upon each other as rivals in fortune and magnificence so that there was no intercourse between them though they lived in the same neighborhood on the contrary, in all disputes they constantly headed the opposite parties. Sir Everhard, understanding that Anthony Darnell had begun to canvass and was putting every iron in the fire, in violation and contempt of the pactum familiae before mentioned, fell into a violent passion that brought on a severe fit of the gout, by which he was disabled from giving personal attention to his own interest. My father, indeed, employed all his diligence and address, and spared neither money, time, nor constitution, till at length he drank himself into a consumption, which was the death of him. But, after all, there is a great difference between a steward and a principal. Mr. Darnell attended in propria persona, flattered and caressed the women, feasted the electors, hired mobs, made processions, and scattered about his money in such a manner that our friends durst hardly show their heads in public. At this very crisis our young squire, to whom his father had written an account of the transaction, 
arrived unexpectedly at gravesbury hall and had a long private conference with sir everhard the news of his return spread like wildfire through all that part of the country bonfires were made and the bells set a ringing in several towns and steeples and next morning above seven hundred people were assembled at the gate with music flags and streamers to welcome their young squire and accompany him to the borough of ashington he set out on foot with his retinue and entered one end of the town just as mr darnell's mob had come in at the other both arrived at about the same time at the market-place but mr darnell mounting first into the balcony of the town-house made a long speech to the people in favour of his own pretensions not without some invidious reflections glanced at sir everhard his competitor we did not much mind the acclamations of his party which we knew had been hired for the purpose but we were in some pain for mr greaves who had not been used to speak in public he took his turn however in the balcony and uncovering his head bowed all round with the most engaging courtesy he was dressed in a green frock trimmed with gold and his own dark hair flowed about his ears in natural curls while his face was overspread with a blush that improved the glow of youth to a deeper crimson and i dare say set many a female heart a palpitating when he made his first appearance there was just such a humming and clapping of hands as you might have heard when the celebrated garrick came upon the stage in king lear or king richard or any other top character but how agreeably were we disappointed when our young gentleman made such an oration as would not have disgraced a pitt an egmont or a murray while he spoke all was hushed in admiration and attention you could have almost heard a feather drop to the ground it would have charmed you to hear with what modesty he recounted the services which his father and grandfather had done to the corporation with what eloquence he expatiated upon the shameful infraction of the treaty subsisting between the two families and with what keen and spirited strokes of satire he retorted the sarcasms of darnell he no sooner concluded his harangue than there was such a burst of applause as seemed to rend the very sky our music immediately struck up our people advanced with their ensigns and as every man had a good cudgel broken heads would have ensued had not mr darnell and his party thought proper to retreat with uncommon dispatch he never offered to make another public entrance as he saw the torrent ran so violently against him but sat down with his loss and withdrew his opposition though at bottom extremely mortified and incensed sir everhard was unanimously elected and appeared to be the happiest man upon earth for besides the pleasure arising from his victory over this competitor he was now fully satisfied that his son instead of disgracing would do honour to his family it would have moved a heart of stone to see with what a tender transport of paternal joy he received his dear lancelot after having heard of his deportment and success at ashington where by the by he gave a ball to the ladies and displayed as much elegance and politeness as if he had been bred at the court of versailles this joyous season was of short duration in a little time all the happiness of the family was overcast by a sad incident which hath left such an unfortunate impression upon the mind of the young gentleman as i am afraid will never be effaced mr darnell's niece and ward the great heiress whose name is aurelia was the most celebrated beauty of the whole country if i said the whole kingdom or indeed all europe perhaps i should barely do her justice i don't pretend to be a limner gentleman nor does it become me to delineate such excellence but surely i may presume to repeat from the play oh she is all that painting can express or youthful poets fancy when they love at that time she might be about seventeen tall and fair and so exquisitely shaped you may talk of your venus de medicis your dianas your nymphs and galateas but if praxiteles and rubiliac and wilton were to lay their heads together in order to make a complete pattern of beauty they would hardly reach her model of perfection as for complexion poets will talk of blending the lily with the rose and bring in a parcel of similes of cowslips carnations pinks and daisies there's dolly now has got a very good complexion indeed she's the very picture of health and innocence you are indeed my pretty lass but parva componera magnus miss darnell is all amazing beauty delicacy and dignity then the softness and expression of her fine blue eyes her pouting lips of coral hue 
her neck that rises like a tower of polished alabaster between two mounds of snow i tell you what gentlemen it don't signify talking if e'er one of you was to meet the young lady alone in the midst of a heath or common or any unfrequented place he would down on his knees and think he'd kneel before some supernatural being i'll tell you more she not only resembles an angel in beauty but a saint in goodness and a hermit in humility so void of all pride and affectation so soft and sweet and affable and humane lord i could tell such instances of her charity sure enough she and sir lancelot were formed by nature for each other howsoever the cruel hand of fortune hath intervened and severed them for ever every soul that knew them both said it was a thousand pities but they should come together and extinguish in their happy union the mutual animosity of the two families which had so often embroiled the whole neighborhood nothing was heard but the praises of miss aurelia darnell and mr launcelot greaves and no doubt the parties were prepossessed by this applause in favor of each other at length mr greaves went one sunday to her parish church but though the greater part of the congregation watched their looks they could not perceive that she took the least notice of him or that he seemed to be struck with her appearance he afterwards had an opportunity of seeing her more at leisure at the york assembly during the races but this opportunity was productive of no good effect because he had that same day quarrelled with her uncle on the turf an old grudge you know gentlemen is soon inflamed to a fresh rupture it was thought mr Donnell came on purpose to show his resentment they differed about a bet upon miss cleverlegs and in the course of the dispute mr Darnell called him a petulant boy the young squire who was as hasty as gunpowder told him he was man enough to chastise him for his insolence and would do it on the spot if he thought it would not interrupt the diversion in all probability they would have come to points immediately had not the gentleman interposed so that nothing further passed but abundance of foul language on the part of mr anthony and a repeated defiance to single combat mr greaves making a low bow retired from the field and in the evening danced at the assembly with a young lady from the bishopric seemingly in good temper and spirits without having any words with mr darnell who was also present but in the morning he visited that proud neighbor betimes and they had almost reached a grove of trees on the north side of the town when they were suddenly overtaken by half a dozen gentlemen who had watched their motions it was in vain for them to dissemble their design which could not now take effect they gave up their pistols and a reconciliation was patched up by the pressing remonstrances of their common friends but mr darnell's hatred still rankled at bottom and soon broke out in the sequel about three months after this transaction his niece aurelia with her mother having been to visit a lady in the chariot the horses being young and not used to the traces were startled at the braying of a jackass on the common and taking fright ran away with the carriage like lightning the coachman was thrown from the box and the ladies screamed piteously for help mr greaves chanced to be a horseback on the other side of an enclosure when he heard their shrieks and riding up the hedge knew the chariot and saw the disaster the horses were then running full speed in such a direction as to drive headlong over a precipice into a stone quarry where they and the chariot and the ladies must be dashed to pieces you may conceive gentlemen what his thoughts were when he saw such a fine young lady in the flower of her age just plunging into eternity when he saw the lovely aurelia on the brink of being precipitated among rocks where her delicate limbs must be mangled and tore asunder when he perceived that before he could ride round by the gate the tragedy would be finished the fence was so thick and high flanked with a broad ditch on the outside that he could not hope to clear it although he was mounted with scipio bred out of miss cowslip the sire muley and his grandsire the famous arabian mustafa Sepia was bred by my father, who would not have taken a hundred guineas for him from any other person but the young squire. Indeed, I have heard my poor father say. By this time Ferret's impatience was become so outrageous that he exclaimed in a furious tone, Damn your father and his horse and his colt into the bargain! Tom made no reply, but began to strip with great expedition. Captain Crow was so choked with passion that he could utter nothing but disjointed sentences. He rose from his seat, brandished his horsewhip, and seizing his nephew by the collar, cried, 
Odds hardikin, Sirrah. I have a good mind. Devil fire your running tackle, you landlubber. Can't you steer without all this tacking hither and thither, and the Lord knows whither? No, at my block, I'd give thee a rope's end for thy supper if it want. Dolly had conceived a sneaking kindness for the young lawyer, and thinking him in danger of being roughly handled, flew to his relief. She twisted her hand in Crow's neckcloth without ceremony, crying, Shout then! I tell thee, old codger, who cares a vig for thy foolish tantrums? While Crow looked black in the face and ran the risk of strangulation under the grip of this Amazon, Mr. Clark, having disengaged himself of his hat, wig, coat, and waistcoat, advanced in an elegant attitude of manual offense towards the misanthrope, who snatched up a gridiron from the chimney corner, and discord seemed to clap her sooty wings in expectation of battle. But, as the reader may have more than once already cursed the unconscionable length of this chapter, we must postpone to the next opportunity the incidents that succeeded this denunciation of war. End of chapter 3Chapter Four of the Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves by Tobias Smollett. Chapter Four, in which it appears that the night, when heartily set in for sleeping, was not easily disturbed. In all probability, the kitchen of the Black Lion, from a domestic temple of society and good fellowship, would have been converted into a scene or stage of sanguinary dispute, had not Pallas, or discretion, interposed in the person of Mr. Fillet, and, with the assistance of the ostler, disarmed the combatants not only of their arms, but also of their resentment. The impetuosity of Mr. Clark was a little checked at sight of the gridiron which Ferret brandished with uncommon dexterity, a circumstance from whence the company were, upon reflection, induced to believe that, before he plunged into the sea of politics, he had occasionally figured in the character of that facetious droll who accompanies your itinerant physicians under the familiar appellation of Mary Andrew or Jack Pudding and on a wooden stage entertains the populace with a solo on the salt box or a sonata on the tongs and gridiron be that as it may the young lawyer seemed to be a little discomposed at the glancing of this extraordinary weapon of offence which the fair hands of dolly had scoured until it had shone as bright as the shield of achilles or as the emblem of good old english fair which hangs by a red ribbon round the neck of that thrice honoured sage's head in velvet bonnet cased who presides by rotation at the genial board distinguished by the title of the beefsteak club where the delicate rumps irresistibly attract the stranger's eye and while they seem to cry come cut me come cut me constrain by wondrous sympathy each mouth to overflow where the obliging and humorous jimmy b the gentle billy h replete with human kindness and the generous johnny b respected and beloved by all the world attend as the priests and ministers of mirth good cheer and jollity and assist with culinary art the raw unpractised awkward guest but to return from this digressive simile the ostler no sooner stepped between these menacing antagonists than tom clark very quietly resumed his clothes and mr ferret resigned the gridiron without further question the doctor did not find it quite so easy to release the throat of captain crow from the masculine grasp of the virago dolly whose fingers could not be disengaged until the honest seaman was almost at the last gasp. After some pause, during which he panted for breath, and untied his neckcloth, "'Damn thee, for a brimstone galley!' cried he. "'I was never so grappled with all since I knew a card from a compass. Ed zooks! The jade is so taut in my rigging, you see, that I... <sighs> Snatch my bowlines! If I come athwart thy hawser i'll turn thy keel upwards or mayhap set thee a-driving under the bare poles i will i will you hell-fire saucy i will dolly made no reply but seeing mr clark sit down again with great composure took her station likewise at the opposite side of the apartment then mr Fillet requested the lawyer to proceed with his story which after three hymns 
he accordingly prosecuted in these words i told you gentlemen that mr greaves was mounted on scipio when he saw miss darnell and her mother in danger of being hurried over a precipice without reflecting a moment he gave scipio the spur and at one spring he cleared five and twenty feet over hedge and ditch and every obstruction then he rode full speed in order to turn the coach horses and finding them quite wild and furious endeavored to drive against the counter of the hither horse which he missed and staked poor scipio on the pole of the coach the shock was so great that the coach horses made a full stop within ten yards of the quarry and mr greaves was thrown forward towards the coach box which mounting with admirable dexterity he seized the reins before the horses could recover of their fright at that instant the coachman came running up and loosed them from the traces with the utmost dispatch mr greaves had now time to give his attention to the ladies who were well nigh distracted with fear he no sooner opened the chariot door than aurelia with a wildness of look sprung into his arms and clasping him round the neck fainted away i leave you to guess jimmin what were his feelings at this instant the mother was not so discomposed but that she could contribute to the recovery of her daughter whom the young squire still supported in his embrace at length she retrieved the use of her senses and perceiving the situation in which she was the blood revisited her face with a redoubled glow while she desired him to set her down upon the turf mrs darnell far from being shy or reserved in her compliments of acknowledgments kissed mr lancelot without ceremony the tears of gratitude running down her cheeks she called him her dear son her generous deliverer who at the hazard of his own life had saved her and her child from the most dismal fate that could be imagined mr greaves was so much transported on this occasion that he could not help disclosing a passion which he had hitherto industriously concealed what i have done said he was but a common office of humanity which i would have performed for any of my fellow-creatures but for the preservation of miss aurelia darnell i would at any time sacrifice my life with pleasure the young lady did not hear this declaration unmoved her face was again flushed and her eyes sparkled with pleasure nor was the youth's confession disagreeable to the good lady her mother who at one glance perceived all the advantages of such a union between the two families mr greaves proposed to send the coachman to his father's stable for a pair of sober horses that could be depended upon to draw the ladies home to their own habitation but they declined the offer and chose to walk as the distance was not great he then insisted upon his being their conductor and each taking him under the arm supported them to their own gate where such an apparition filled all the domestics with astonishment mrs darnell taking him by the hand led him into the house where she welcomed him with another affectionate embrace and indulged him with an ambrosial kiss of aurelia saying but for you we had both been by this time in eternity sure it was heaven that sent you as an angel to our assistance she kindly inquired if he had himself sustained any damage in administering that desperate remedy to which they owed their lives she entertained him with a small collation and in the course of the conversation lamented the animosity which had so long divided two neighboring families of such influence and character he was not slow in signifying his approbation of her remarks and expressing the most eager desire of seeing all those unhappy differences removed in a word they parted with mutual satisfaction just as he advanced from the outward gate on his return to gravesbury hall he was met by anthony darnell on horseback who riding up to him with marks of surprise and resentment saluted him with your servant sir have you any commands for me the other replying with an air of indifference none at all mr darnell asked what had procured him the honor of a visit the young gentleman perceiving it by the manner in which he spoke that the old quarrel was not yet extinguished answered with equal disdain that the visit was not intended for him and that if he wanted to know the cause of it he might inform himself by his own servants so i shall cried the uncle of aurelia and perhaps let you know my sentiments of the matter hereafter as it may be said the youth who turning out of the avenue walked home and made his father acquainted with the particulars of this adventure 
the old gentleman chid him for his rashness but seemed pleased with the success of his attempt and still more so when he understood his sentiments of aurelia and the department of the ladies next day the son sent over a servant with a compliment to inquire about their health and the messenger being seen by mr darnell was told that the ladies were indisposed and did not choose to be troubled with messages the mother was really seized with the fever produced by the agitation of her spirits which every day became more and more violent until the physicians despaired of her life believing that her end approached she sent a trusty servant to mr greaves desiring that she might see him without delay and he immediately set out with the messenger who introduced him in the dark he found the old lady in bed almost exhausted and the fair aurelia sitting by her overwhelmed with grief her lovely hair in the utmost disorder and her charming eyes inflamed with weeping the good lady beckoning mr lancelot to approach and directing all the attendants to quit the room except a favorite maid from whom i learned the story she took him by the hand and fixing her eyes upon him with all the fondness of a mother shed some tears in silence while the same marks of sorrow trickled down his cheeks after this affecting pause my dear son said she oh that i could have lived to see you so indeed you find me hastening to the goal of life here the tender-hearted aurelia being unable to contain herself longer broke out into a violent passion of grief and wept aloud the mother waiting patiently till she had thus given vent to her anguish calmly entreated her to resign herself submissively to the will of heaven then turning to mr lancelot i had indulged said she a fond hope of seeing you allied to my family this is no time for me to insist upon the ceremonies and forms of a vain world aurelio looks upon you with the eyes of tender prepossession no sooner had she pronounced these words than he threw himself on his knees before the young lady and pressing her hand to his lips breathed the softest expressions which the most delicate love could suggest i know resumed the mother that your passion is mutually sincere and i should die satisfied if i thought your union would not be opposed but that violent man my brother-in-law who is aurelia's sole guardian will thwart her wishes with every obstacle that that brutal resentment and implacable malice can contrive mr greaves i have long admired your virtues and am confident that i can depend upon your honor you shall give me your word that when i am gone you will take no steps in this affair without the concurrence of your father and endeavor by all fair and honorable means to vanquish the prejudices and obtain the consent of her uncle the rest we must leave to the disposition of providence the squire promised in the most solemn and fervent manner to obey all her injunctions as the last dictates of a parent whom he should never cease to honor then she favored them both with a great deal of salutary advice touching their conduct before and after marriage and presented him with a ring as a memorial of her affection at the same time he pulled another off his finger and made a tender of it as a pledge of his love to aurelia whom her mother permitted to receive this token finally he took a last farewell of the good matron and returned to his father with the particulars of this interview in two days mrs darnell departed this life and amelia was removed to the house of a relation where her grief had liked to have proved fatal to her constitution in the meantime the mother was no sooner committed to the earth than mr greaves mindful of her exhortations began to take measures for reconciliation with the guardian he engaged several gentlemen to interpose their good offices but they always met with the most mortifying repulse and at last anthony darnell declared that his hatred to the house of greaves was hereditary habitual and unconquerable he swore he would spend his heart's blood to perpetuate the quarrel and that sooner than his niece should match with young lancelot he would sacrifice her with his own hand the young gentleman finding his prejudice so rancorous and invincible left off making any further advances and since he found it impossible to obtain his consent resolved to cultivate the good graces of aurelia and wed her in despite of her implacable guardian he found means to establish a literary correspondence with her as soon as her grief was a little abated and even to effect an interview after her return to her own house 
but he soon had reason to repent of his indulgence the uncle entertained spies upon the young lady who gave him an account of this meeting in consequence of which she was suddenly hurried to some distant part of the country which we never could discover it was then we thought mr lancelot a little disordered in his brain his grief was so wild and his passion so impetuous he refused all sustenance neglected his person renounced his amusements rode out in the rain sometimes bareheaded strolled about the fields all night and became so peevish that none of the domestics durst speak to him without the hazard of broken bones having played these pranks for about three weeks to the unspeakable chagrin of his father and the astonishment of all that knew him he suddenly grew calm and his good humor returned but this as your seafaring people say was a deceitful calm that soon ushered in a dreadful storm he had long sought an opportunity to tamper with some of mr darnell's servants who could inform him of the place where aurelia was confined but there was not one about the family who could give him that satisfaction for the persons who accompanied her remained as a watch upon her motions and none of the other domestics were privy to the transaction all attempts proving fruitless he could no longer restrain his impatience but throwing himself in the way of the uncle upbraided him in such harsh terms that a formal challenge ensued they agreed to decide their difference without witnesses and one morning before sunrise met on the very common where mr greaves had saved the life of aurelia the first pistol was fired on each side without any effect but mr darnell's second wounded the young squire in the flank nevertheless having a pistol in reserve he desired his antagonist to ask his life the other instead of submitting drew his sword and mr greaves firing his piece into the air followed his example the contest then became very hot though of short continuance darnell being disarmed at the first onset our young squire gave him back the sword which he was base enough to use a second time against his conqueror such an instance of repeated ingratitude and brutal ferocity divested mr greaves of his temper and forbearance he attacked mr anthony with great fury and at the first lunge ran him up to the hilt at the same time seized with his left hand the shell of his enemy's sword which he broke in disdain mr darnell having fallen the other immediately mounted his horse which he had tied to a tree before the engagement and riding full speed to ashington sent a surgeon to anthony's assistance he afterwards ingenuously confessed all these particulars to his father who was overwhelmed with consternation for the wounds of darnell were judged mortal and as no person had seen the particulars of the duel mr lancelot might have been convicted of murder on these considerations before a warrant could be served upon him the old knight by dint of the most eager entreaties accompanied with marks of horror and despair prevailed upon his son to withdraw himself from the kingdom until such time as the storm should be overblown had his heart been unengaged he would have chosen to travel but at this period when his whole soul was engrossed and so violently agitated by his passion for aurelia nothing but the fear of seeing the old gentleman run distracted would have induced him to desist from the pursuit of that young lady far less quit the kingdom where she resided well then gentlemen he repaired to harwick where he embarked for holland from whence he proceeded to brussels where he procured a passport from the french king by virtue of which he travelled to Marseilles, and there took a tartan for genoa the first letter sir everhard received from him was dated at florence meanwhile the surgeon's prognostic was not altogether verified mr darnell did not die immediately of his wounds but he lingered a long time as it were in the arms of death and even partly recovered yet in all probability he will never be wholly restored to the enjoyment of his health and is obliged every summer to attend the hot well at bristol as his wounds began to heal his hatred to mr greaves seemed to revive with augmented violence and he is now if possible more than ever determined against all reconciliation mr lancelot after having endeavoured to amuse his imagination with a succession of curious objects in a tour of italy took up his residence at a town called pisa and there fell into a deep melancholy from which nothing could rouse him but the news of his father's death the old gentleman god rest his soul never held up his head after the departure of his darling lancelot 
and the dangerous condition of darnell kept up his apprehension this was reinforced by the obstinate silence of the youth and certain accounts of his disordered mind which he had received from some of those persons who take pleasure in communicating disagreeable tidings a complication of all these grievances cooperating with a severe fit of the gout and gravel produced a fever which in a few days brought sir everhard to his long home after he had settled his affairs with heaven and earth and made his peace with god and man i'll assure you gentlemen he made a most edifying and christian end he died regretted by all his neighbors except anthony and might be said to be embalmed by the tears of the poor to whom he was always a bounteous benefactor when the son now sir lancelot came home he appeared so meagre wan and hollow-eyed that the servants hardly knew their young master his first care was to take possession of his fortune and settle accounts with the steward who had succeeded my father these affairs being discussed he spared no pains to get intelligence concerning miss darnell and soon learned more of that young lady than he desired to know for it was become the common talk of the country that a match was agreed upon between her and young squire sycamore a gentleman of a very great fortune these tidings were probably confirmed under her own hand in a letter which she wrote to sir lancelot the contents were never exactly known but to the parties themselves nevertheless the effects were too visible for from that blessed moment he spoke not one word to any living creature for the space of three days but was seen sometimes to shed a flood of tears and sometimes to burst out into a fit of laughing at last he broke silence and seemed to wake from his disorder he became more fond than ever of the exercise of riding and began to amuse himself again with acts of benevolence one instance of his generosity and justice deserves to be recorded in brass or marble you must know gentlemen the rector of the parish was lately dead and sir everhard had promised the presentation to another clergyman in the meantime sir lancelot chancing one sunday to ride through a lane perceived a horse saddled and bridled feeding on the side of a fence and casting his eyes around beheld on the other side of the hedge an object lying extended on the ground which he took to be the body of a murdered traveller he forthwith alighted and leaping into the field decried a man at full length wrapped in a greatcoat and writhing in agony approaching nearer he found it was a clergyman in his gown and cassock when he inquired into the case and offered his assistance the stranger rose up thanked him for his courtesy and declared that he was now very well the knight who thought there was something mysterious in this incident expressed a desire to know the cause of his rolling in the grass in that manner and the clergyman who knew his person made no scruple in gratifying his curiosity you must know sir said he i serve the curacy of your own parish for which the late incumbent paid me twenty pounds a year but this sum being scarce sufficient to maintain my wife and children who are five in number i agreed to read prayers in the afternoon at another church about four miles from hence and for this additional duty i received ten pounds more as i keep a horse it was formerly an agreeable exercise rather than a toil but of late years i have been afflicted with a rupture for which i consulted the most eminent operators in the kingdom but i have no cause to rejoice in the effects of their advice though one of them assured me i was completely cured the malady is now more troublesome than ever and often comes upon me so violently while i am on the horseback that i am forced to alight and lie down upon the ground until the cause of the disorder can for the time be reduced sir lancelot not only condoled with him upon his misfortune but desired him to throw up the second cure and he would pay him ten pounds a year out of his own pocket your generosity confounds me good sir replied the clergyman and yet i ought not to be surprised at any instance of benevolence in sir lancelot greaves but i will check the fullness of my heart i shall only observe that your good intention towards me can hardly take effect the gentleman who is to succeed the late incumbent has given me notice to quit the premises as he hath provided a friend of his own for the curacy what cried the knight does he mean to take your bread from you without assigning any other reason surely sir replied the ecclesiastic i know of no other reason i hope my morals are irreproachable and that i have done my duty with a conscientious regard i may venture an appeal to the parishioners among whom i have lived these seventeen years 
after all it is natural for every man to favor his own friends in preference to strangers as for me i propose to try my fortune in the great city and i doubt not but providence will provide for me and my little ones to this declaration sir lancelot made no reply but riding home set on foot a strict inquiry into the character of this man whose name was jenkins he found that he was a reputed scholar equally remarkable for his modesty and good life that he visited the sick assisted the needy compromised disputes among his neighbors and spent his time in such a manner as would have done honor to any christian divine thus informed the knight sent for the gentleman to whom the living had been promised and accosted him to this effect mr tootle i have a favor to ask of you the person who serves the cure of this parish is a man of good character beloved by the people and has a large family i shall be obliged to you if you will continue him in the curacy the other told him he was sorry he could not comply with his request being that he had already promised the curacy to a friend of his own no matter replied sir lancelot since i have not interest with you i will endeavor to provide for mr jenkins in some other way that same afternoon he walked over to the curate's house and told him that he had spoken in his behalf to dr tootle but the curacy was pre-engaged the good man having made a thousand acknowledgments for the trouble his honor had taken i have not interest sufficient to make you curate said the knight but i can give you the living itself and that you shall have so saying he retired leaving mr jenkins incapable of uttering one syllable so powerfully was he struck with this unexpected turn of good fortune the presentation was immediately made out and in a few days mr jenkins was put in possession of his benefice to the inexpressible joy of the congregation hitherto everything went right and every unprejudiced person commended the knight's conduct but in a little time his generosity seemed to overleap the bounds of discretion and even in some cases might be thought tending to be a breach of the king's peace for example he compelled v et armis a rich farmer's son to marry the daughter of a cottager whom the young fellow had debauched indeed it seems there was a promise of marriage in the case though it could not be legally ascertained the wench took on dismally and her parents had recourse to sir lancelot who sending for the delinquent expostulated with him severely on the injury he had done the young woman and exhorted him to save her life and reputation by performing his promise in which case he sir lancelot would give her three hundred pounds to her portion whether the farmer thought there was something interested in this uncommon offer or was a little elevated by the consciousness of his father's wealth he rejected the proposal with rustic disdain and said if so be as how the wench would swear the child to him he would settle it with the parish but declared that no squire in the land should oblige him to buckle with such a cracked pitcher this resolution however he could not maintain for in less than two hours the rector of the parish had direction to publish the bans and a ceremony was performed in due course now though we know not precisely the nature of the arguments that were used with the farmer we may conclude they were of a minatory species for the young fellow could not for some time look any person in the face the knight acted as the general redresser of grievances if a woman complained to him of being ill-treated by her husband he first inquired into the foundation of the complaint and if he found it just catechized the defendant if the warning had no effect and the man proceeded to fresh acts of violence then his judge took the execution of the law in his own hand and horsewhipped the party thus he involved himself in several lawsuits that drained him of pretty large sums of money he seemed particularly incensed at the least appearance of oppression and supported diverse poor tenants against the extortion of their landlords nay he has been known to travel two hundred miles as a volunteer to offer his assistance in the cause of a person who he had heard was by chicanery or oppression wronged of considerable estate he accordingly took her under his protection relieved her distresses and was at a vast expense in bringing the suit to a determination which being unfavorable to his client he resolved to bring an appeal into the house of lords and certainly would have executed his purpose if the gentlewoman had not died in the interim at this period ferret interrupted the narrator by observing that the said greaves was a common nuisance and ought to be prosecuted on the statute of barratry no sir resumed mr clark he cannot be convicted of barratry unless he is always at variance with some person or other 
a mover of suits and quarrels who disturbs the peace under color of law therefore he is in the indictment styled communis malfactor calumniator et simonatra lidium prithee truce with thy definitions cried ferret and make an end to thy long-winded story thou hast no title to be so tedious until thou comest to have a quaff in the court of common pleas tom smiled contemptuous and had just opened his mouth to proceed when the company were disturbed by a hideous repetition of groans that seemed to issue from the chamber in which the body of the squire was deposited the landlady snatched the candle and ran into the room followed by the doctor and the rest and this accident naturally suspended the narration in like manner we shall conclude the chapter that the reader may have time to breathe and digest what has already been heard End of chapter 4